Welcome back. Now we had just finished our first major mathematical interlude talking about complex numbers and differential equations. So now we're finally ready to return to talking about waves and vibrations. So in this video we're going to transition back and the way we're going to do that is we're actually going to rederive our general solution for simple harmonic motion. Except this time we're going to take a much more direct approach, this uh, hopefully applying some of the cool techniques we picked up from complex numbers and differential equations. So let's get started and let's return to our ever so familiar mass and spring system. So let's say that we have this mass and spring system, a spring of stiffness k and a block of mass m. And we're going to say that this is an ideal system and that the only force acting on the system, once when we displace it, is Hooke's force, which we know as F is equal to negative kx. And we remember that the x here, well, if this is the x-axis, the x here is our displacement from its resting length or natural length. And the reason why this negative sign is here is to indicate that this is a restoring force. So the force will always be going in the opposite direction of whatever displacement. Now, if this is the only force, we can plug it into Newton's second law, which is that F, well, the net force, is equal to the mass times acceleration. So we can plug that in here and we can rewrite, well, we get that negative kx is equal to m times the acceleration. And if the block is only moving in the x direction in one dimension, then we can rewrite the acceleration as just the second derivative of x with respect to time. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify this up a bit by adding kx to both sides and dividing by m in which case we're going to get the second derivative of x with respect to time plus k divided by m times x. All of that is equal to zero. And here we hopefully recognize we have a differential equation. And we've worked with quite a lot of these, so we know that this is indeed a second order uh, differential equation. It's linear, it's homogeneous, and it has constant coefficients. So we know how to solve a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients. Essentially, we're gonna be trying out the test function. X is equal to E raised to the RT, where R is our root. And we're gonna plug this into here and try and find values of R that will satisfy this equation. So if we do that, uh, we can take the second derivative, that's going to be r squared times e to the rt plus k times m, sorry, k divided by m times e to the rt. All of that is equal to zero. So we can factor out e to the rt. So we get r squared plus k divided by m is equal to zero. Now, we want to try and find like a value for r that will make this expression hold for all values of t. And we know that e to the rt, that equals zero, but only when t approaches negative infinity. So for this expression to hold, it must be this term that must equal zero. So therefore, r squared plus k divided by m must be equal to zero, which means that r is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative k divided by m. And here we recognize we have a negative sign under a radical. So we can just rewrite that immediately as plus or minus the imaginary unit i times the square root of k divided by m. Now at this point here we can try and do a substitution. We can just say, for the sake of convenience, that omega is defined as the square root of k divided by m 
or we could just uh, meaning that omega squared is equal to k divided by m. But if we make that substitution, we get that we have our two values of r. r is equal to plus i times omega, and r is equal to negative i omega, which means our two solutions, if we plug that in here, are x is equal to e to the plus i omega t, and x is equal to e to the negative i omega t. So these are two functions that satisfy this differential equation. Now, although these two functions satisfy it, we can say that the most general solution that describes all solutions to this differential equation we know that's going to be a linear combination of these two solutions. So we can say that x of t is equal to a linear combination, which is just a constant times the first solution plus a constant times the second solution. So we found our general solution. However, we can rewrite this general solution in a way that's a bit more convenient to or intuitive. And we can do that by applying our main formula from complex numbers, Euler's formula. So we know that e to the i omega t by Euler's formula, this is going to be equal to cosine omega t plus i times sine omega t. Likewise, we know that e to the negative i omega t that's essentially the same as plugging in negative omega here and here and using the fact that cosine is even and that sine is odd we get that e to the negative i omega t is equal to cosine omega t minus i times sine omega t so we can plug these two formulas in here and rewrite our solution in terms of sines and cosines so if we do that, we get that x of t is equal to c1 times cosine omega t plus i times sine omega t plus, I'm just going to rewrite it down here, c2 times cosine omega t minus i times sine omega t. Now we can regroup these in terms of sines and cosines. So we can get that x of t, that's just going to be equal to cosine omega t times c1 plus c2. And all that plus sine omega t times, uh, we're going to get c1 minus c2, all of that times i. So this is just another way to rewrite this. Now, c1 and c2, those are just our two undetermined coefficients. We can figure out the value of these undetermined coefficients if we had initial conditions. But c1 and c2 just have one value. They're constants which means if c1 just has one value and c2 just has one value then c1 plus c2 will just have one value likewise c1 minus c2 will just have one value so we can rewrite this the set of constants in terms of just new cleaner constants so we can just rewrite this as x of t is equal to a cosine omega t plus b times sine omega t. Here our two undetermined coefficients are a and b where a is equal to c1 plus c2 and b is equal to i times c1 minus c2. But there we have it. We found the general solution in terms of nice neat real functions. And this was indeed the same solution we got in the very beginning when we first started talking about waves and vibrations. 
but we're able to do, get, do it much more directly by using complex numbers and differential equations. But that more or less wraps up simple harmonic motion, and pretty soon we're going to start talking about variations of that, like dampened harmonic motion, forced harmonic motion, and even coupled harmonic motion. And pretty much in each of those cases, we're going to basic, we're going to basically do the same exact protocol that we did here. We're first going to draw out, out our model, then find out what forces are acting on our system, plug it into Newton's second equation, and we're going to get a differential equation. We're then going to try and find the general solution to that differential equation. And then we're going to analyze this general solution to try and see if it tells us anything cool about the scenario. Basically, analyze it to look at the physics of what's going on. And that's more or less going to be the game plan for the next, like, whole bunch of videos. So with that, let's finally start talking about dampened harmonic motion. So I'll well, see you in the next video.